I will do, you know, dollars to donuts. That the biggest source of process inefficiency isn't the technology and it's not the people, it's the policies of the government. Welcome to Process Pioneers, the show that takes a deep dive into the minds of decision makers, key influencers, and process experts who are pioneering the world of everything process. Welcome to another episode of Process Pioneers. Uh, my name is Daniel Rayner. I'm the host of Process Pioneers, and today I have the absolute privilege of sitting down with John Meredith. Uh, now, John is the Managing Director of JC Management consulting. Uh, he's also is the um, former GM process management and improvement, um, well, general manager of process management improvement at CBA. He's also former head of process excellence at Aldermore Bank, which is in the UK, if you weren't aware. Um, and also most of his career, or a large part of his career was spent with uh, GE Capital. Um, I think, John, you were saying around 26 years or, or thereabouts, um, depending on what, what it was actually called. But um, And for those that are familiar with the Process Pioneers series and, and have seen the Dan O'Neill episode, um, he's, he's the former Chief Process Officer at, at CBA. Um, and Dan actually mentioned to me, he was the one that referred John on to me and Dan said that, uh, John taught him everything he knows about BPM. So I'm really excited about this interview. Uh, John, thanks for joining me. It's my pleasure, Daniel. Thank you. So what we normally do to get um, started or get kicked off into the interview is mm -hmm. I'll pass the ball to you, uh, to give us a bit of a, um, a introduction into how you got started in BPM and then a brief timeline leading up to where you are today. And basically that just gives our audience a bit of a context for who you are, um, your experience, your background, and that'll, I guess, give a framework for how you respond to the, the next questions. Mm -hmm. Sure. Okay. Um, yeah. So I guess I'm going to start out by dating myself. And so how I got into this was before the term BPM even existed, I suppose, and before the term process engineering or re-engineering um, was existed. So back in uh, my very first job out of university uh, was for a company called ITT Commercial Finance, which ended up becoming part of GE Capital, uh, which is where that, that came from. So I was originally a financial accountant. Uh, for them and for the first time this was you know back in 1985 back in the days when every most major companies were still working off the mainframes and very few people had PCs or certainly no one had a laptop or anything like that <laughs> and for the very first time our systems became um, sophisticated enough that we could actually do product by product uh, financial reporting so my company did inventory financing for things like cars and boats and uh, mobile homes and things like that. And so for the first time, we could actually see how much profit or loss we we're actually making on those various different product lines. Right. And so that was given over to me to do. So I had to figure out, so I had to determine what were all the processes that were, and they were different, you know, for financing it versus financing a boat, you know, the process that we went, were, went through were very difficult. And what we discovered, mm -hmm was that the automobile financing that we did was extremely hands-on and very manual, uh, manually intensive and extraordinarily costly. And so we made the decision to exit that portfolio, actually, uh, right. based on you know, our processes. There was no way that we could service our customers and still make a profit at the same time. So we decided to exit that particular product line. Now, the reason I bring it up, why it's kind of interesting is that my own father was one of our customers. And, <laughs> and what, what happened was that we cut his credit line off almost overnight, which we shouldn't have done, which almost drove <laughs> him out of business, which almost drove him out of business. Right. Um, so it's kind of funny. So um, yeah, that I almost put my own father out of business because of, because of the way that our company managed our processes. So I thought right. that was kind of funny. Uh, anyway, so long story short. So I, I kind of got the, reputation within that entity of being the guy that you the go-to guy for how much does everything cost to actually season then obviously the the logical follow-up was to that was all right well if it's a bad process now how, how can we make it more efficient so that right. was kind of the 
the the career trajectory I, I took within that organization well before you know anybody knew the term you know this was even before ITQM and things like that. Um, so now ultimately then General Electric or GE Capital bought my division and GE for anybody who knows the history of GE and Jack Welsh big 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 in, in six, six, Lean Six Sigma all of that so then went through that whole process uh, and then eventually became what uh, the managing director or the director of commercial excellence for our Eastern European offices. Now, a lot of people probably even haven't even heard of commercial excellence, but what it is, it's a subset of process ex of business process excellence, and it focuses on the sales processes themselves. Right. So right. how can you make the sales process as efficient as possible, make sure that salespeople are trained up to be as efficient as possible with their sales. Right. Um, after that, then I went into the, over to Aldemore, um, had been headhunted over there. That was a startup bank at the time, what was called Challenger Banks, um, who were you know, competing against uh, Royal Bank of Scotland, Barclays Banks, Lloyds, all the big banks in the UK. Uh, then I was there for a couple of years, then got headhunted to go down to CBA. So, right. so there for four years, and then now I'm semi-retired. Right. What a history. So, yeah. And um, I'm assuming that like having been, um, having been in the UK, having been in Australia, um, and um, you would have seen the difference in, I guess, culture or the difference in how process is done in different um, geographical locations. Mm. Is there a difference and, and what sort of differences have you, I guess, experienced between the different areas of the world? Uh, yeah, and so I'll also add into their North America and Germany uh, as yes, well. Yes, right. So, um, yeah, so the, the Germans, uh, are, it's a lot easier to get them to, you know, say, you know, here is a pro And because they're so, because, you know, you've got BMW and Porsche and all the big auto, uh, Mercedes-Benz, all the big auto companies there who are very, very process-focused almost by definition. So getting... A lot of the Germans, particularly in Dusseldorf, which is where I work, which is a very heavily industrial area, to understand the benefits of doing process management, that was actually kind of easy. Um, the UK and Australia, the, the culture is fairly similar. Um, North America, it's a little bit different. The, I guess the biggest difference was probably between North America and, and Australia. Mm -hmm. um, and the, the difference being that in, in Australia, my experience was to try to get someone to take own, process ownership is probably the biggest area of difference. And in order to get somebody to take full end-to-end -end responsibility for process ownership, even whether or not you know, a specific department reports to them or not, but if, as long as it's in the value chain, trying to identify one specific process owner, which is now what they have to do in terms of, um, uh, if your listeners don't know what the BEAR regime is, the B-E-A-R, it's, it's global legislation for, stands for the Banking Executive Accountability Regime. And it, it, it basically dictates that within the financial services community, there has to be one and one only person responsible for a full, end, or accountable, excuse me, for a full end-to-end -end process. Right, right. Uh, Getting it, it, and maybe it was specific to CBA, I don't know, but getting one person to take responsibility for the full end and, and um, process was actually quite difficult from a cultural right. standpoint. Right. Whereas in North America, it's exactly the opposite. Everyone wants to take control. You know, it's like, oh, give it to me, give it to me. I, I, I want it. So that maybe, maybe we're just by definition, maybe we're control freaks. I don't know. But, <laughs> <laughs> but that, that was the, the biggest difference. And the UK falls somewhere in the middle of that. You'll have some people who, you know, willingly take control, and then others who eschew it and don't want to be, you know, don't want any part of the whole thing. But that was that I think was the biggest differentiator between cultural difference difference that I noticed so far. And, and how did you handle that or how did you manage that um, in Australia and particularly when you do have yeah. people that didn't want to take that ownership 
um, yeah, how, how did you get that buy-in or how do you convince them that this is mm. what needs to happen? This is going to help everyone. This is going to help us um, read our strategic objections or our goals. Like how did you yeah. um, get that buy-in? Yeah, so so the best way of going about that was, you know, in, instead of making it about them or even somebody else in the bank, make it about the end user, the customer. You know? right. So what is, in the, what is in the best ultimate you know, benefit of our end user customer. And that's the person that whether you're in the front end, you know, which of the sales almost always is the sales part, or you're always, or you're way at the back end, which are the people that do, you know, customer offboarding, you know, at, as a, you know, just an example, we all want to make sure that our customer is delighted and, has as least you know problems as possible and is satisfied with the service that we provide. Otherwise, they're going to go elsewhere. So when you when you focus things in those terms, people tend to you know forget about well they don't completely forget about you know their responsibility, but they're a little bit more willing to to take on that mantle, if you will. Right, right, right. And, and apart from that process ownership challenge, what, what, are, what is the biggest challenge? I'm not sure if there is one, just one, but what is the biggest challenge you've seen when an organization tries to, I guess, start their BPM journey? Or I guess, mm. it's, a, I guess it's a big mindset shift. But talk to yeah. us about one of the biggest challenges you, you see organizations face. Yeah, so... Um and I specifically lectured on this actually at QUT. Um, what, so to me, there's kind of different phases or different motivations for why companies try to either engage or adopt uh, a BPM um, ethos. And a lot of times it's what I call the, um, uh, you know, in, in every revolution, there's one man with a vision kind of thing uh, is one way about it. And that was certainly true at CBA where, um, the, the prior CEO in the Rev before Matt Common, he was very, very uh, tuned in and understood what BPM was. And, and, and because he had a strategy background, uh, very much wanted to uh, bring a process centric uh, ethos uh, to, to the bank. Other times you get these, what I call the, uh, the jump on the bandwagon approach. And it's where somebody went away to um, some, you know, you know, management weekend retreat or whatever, or they read an article in the Harvard Business Review, and they're like, "Oh, this is great! You know, let's do this," <laughs> without really understanding, you know, what it's all about. Or other times, and then the, probably the worst one is where they're forced into it um, by events. And, and, you know, I wouldn't be at all surprised if, you know, in 2020 with, with COVID, that there were, would probably might be a number of companies who have adopted BPM because they had to, good reasons or bad reasons, the good reasons being, okay, every remote, now we have to have really good clear-cut processes because I can't just reach over to Sally now and ask her how I do this. I have to have good operating procedures. So that would be on the good side. Mm -hmm. On the negative side, it might be I need to cut costs so desperately that the only way I can do this is maybe a BPM kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, so there's those different kinds of motivation or there might be others as well, but those are to me kind of why a company starts these things. And so the first one, the, you know, the person with the vision, um, those can work quite well uh, as long as a, that person stays around <laughs> for, for a while uh, and B that you, you make crystal clear. Uh, and this was kind of a, one of the reasons, one of the problems that Dan and I had at CBA, you make it crystal, crystal clear that, you know, this is going to take, you're not going to start seeing answers in three months or six months or, and maybe not even a year. And, and again, I, I, my perspective is from working with very large corporations. Obviously, if you have a small corporation, it might go faster. Or mm -hmm. even just a small business would go faster. But for large corporations, with just through inertia and training and all the various things. And then just even when you implement 
a BPM solution, it will take you know, three to six months to start actually bearing the fruit of good business process management. So you have to make it very clear that this might take 18 months to two years for you to really start seeing you know, real benefits back from this. So be patient, you know, so you need, need people who A, understand what BPM is all about, but B, are willing to put in, uh, and to me, you know, everyone talks about money all the time. To me, it's less about the money, the monetary commitment, the time commitment. Right, right. And, and you mentioned they're talking about the benefits and I think that's really key. I think obviously they need to be, an organization needs to be aware that, yeah. hey, we're not, we're not giving you a, a silver bullet here. We're not giving you a, 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 a switch that you can flick and tomorrow everything's going to be all amazing and wonderful. But um, yeah. talk to us about those benefits or because uh, obviously when you're, whether it's driven from a bottom up or a top down approach, and that, that's another question I want to ask in a little bit, um, but um, how you, how do you pitch that value around BPM and what what is what is the biggest win you've seen with BPM? Because I guess that that's really what it comes down to is the senior execs want to know well what's our return on investment going to be what what do you what's it going to do for us you know mm-hmm. yeah no and, and that's fine and and you can certainly you know look at just the the, the monetary side of thing at into that in a second but. To me, I think that there's oftentimes, uh, you know, getting, changing the culture of an organization is perhaps the biggest benefit of all. Um, because to me, when, when you do that, everything else just kind of falls into place. So it's changing people's mindsets to always be looking at things from the full end-to-end perspective from a customer centric perspective of we are doing this process because someone is paying us for it. And who is that person? It's a end user customer. What are their expectations? How do we exceed their expectations so that we get more and more? Because there's been long, you know, long studies that if someone is really satisfied with a good, has a good customer experience, you know, or someone, sorry, if someone has a bad customer experience, they tell 10 people, you know, and so you, and it gets this exponential effect. So you want to avoid that at all costs. So the Mm. best way to avoid that is by doing a good customer experience. So getting everyone to understand, and this was what GE Capital was extraordinarily good at, is that, you know, everybody from the receptionist at the front desk to the mail clerk, to the CEO themselves had to go through a minimum of, um, what was called at the time, it was called the, the CAP program, which was Change Acceleration Program, but it's basically continuous improvement. Uh, right. Understand. And everyone had to do that. And then you were also uh, encouraged to become uh, a Six Sigma Green Belt black, black Belt or a Master Black Belt. And the purpose of the reason why Jack Welch did that is because, yeah, the, he was going to see all kinds of tangible benefits, but it was also to indoctrinate people with the mentality that if I see something and I have an idea of how that can how that process can be better, it's just going to benefit everybody. And even if it's just little things, you know, little things add up over time. Yeah. So, so yeah. So to answer your question, uh, I would say that. First and foremost, the biggest benefit is changing the culture so that that just becomes, it gets into your DNA. It becomes part of the corporate DNA. That's just how we work. We do things. And so when new projects come, you know, come down the pipeline, you're not necessarily looking for a very tactical solution to, oh, how do I solve the problem with deceased estates? It's how do I make this customer experience better? And then also, oh, you know, we've got a solution for this can we use it, you know, so instead of all narrowly focusing on one area thing, okay, well, let's design something that's, you know, not only going to be future proof, but other parts of the business that we don't normally think about can use it as well. Uh, the other thing I was, I was going to mention just about costs and things like that is on the financial side, you know, people, I think, focus way too much on cost out. And, uh, you know, and this, I hate to use the word harvesting and things like that. I've, I've always, always, always been a proponent of, you know, what is your CI ratio? What is your cost to income ratio? Right. And, and to me, that's a far more. 
important metric because, and again, this goes back to what I was saying about the commercial excellence experience I had at GE. It wasn't about bringing down the cost. It was about increasing the revenue. So it was about the, you know, the, the, denominator, the denominator in that equation, not the numerator. And, right. you know, and sometimes it's way better to increase your revenue than it is to just focus on decreasing your costs. And there's a balance, you know, between the two. Uh, they're not mutually exclusive, but I think oftentimes companies, when they hear BPM, they think only about the you know, numerator in that equation and not the denominator. Okay. Okay. And, and just on that, um, cause obviously that, that is an objection to BPM. Um, what, what, what are the most common objections that, um, you've experienced yourself or you've heard of that, that, um, whether it's driven from a, a bottom up approach, you know, yeah. there are different organizations where you've got keen BPM practitioners. Maybe they've worked mm -hmm. in a really process centric organization. They've been mm -hmm. brought, brought across to a, another organization with a completely different mm -hmm. culture um, that mm -hmm. doesn't have that BPM mindset. Um, yeah. What are the objections that they're going to face when trying to get this BPM off the ground? Yeah, so the, the, the single biggest one I, I always, 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 you know, come across, and I'm sure other of your interviewees have said the same thing, is the, oh, I don't have time for this, you know. And there's very few people I've met who will argue against BPM. They're all, and you'll always hear, oh, you know, theoretically, it sounds great, I get it, I, you know, understand where you're going from, coming from, blah, 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 blah but I just don't have time to help you right now because I've got a million other things to do. Um, that, that's, that is always the, the biggest obstacle I think that you run into. Um, and I'm sure your next question is going, how do you, how do you respond to that objection? <laughs> uh, and my answer is always to, to give them, you know, sometimes it'll be tongue in cheek and say, well, in the time that we've had this argument, you know, I could have helped you already doing, or you could have helped me with stuff. Um, <laughs> but so what, what we did in the workshop, what we did with, uh, at CBA and this worked quite well is that we said, look, we understand that your time is valuable. We understand that the, that your staff's time is incredibly valuable, but, all what we want to do is we will send in really good facilitators we will really good process modelers really good or uh, and somebody who most likely has already has has a history of having worked in your unit before or understands your business so we're not going to send in somebody into the commercial lending um process or to, to try to help you with fix that or you know uh, make that more efficient who knows absolutely nothing about it we'll find somebody and then and we were lucky enough that we had a good cross um, crossbreed of folks who had lots of different experience um, so we would get everybody in a room and say look we're going to do a brain dump we just need your your subject matter experts your SMEs for half a day and then we would just, you know, it, it would be a massive, and these people came out and they were tired as shit. Um, but because you know, it was so intense with, you know, how do you do this? How do you do that? How do you do that? But so we made it as unobtrusive as possible. And then we would do all the work for them. And then they would have to just come back and um, basically just validate everything, you know, that we had put together and say, is this uh, accurate and true representation of what you said your process is and how it works. Mm -hmm. And then we could start analyzing it from, from there. So, and then, but the, and the other way that you confront that argument is by giving them evidence of another part of the business where you've already been in, you've already helped and you, you have concrete results. I mean, that, that's, that's the simplest way, but that's usually the best way of responding to an objection by the senior leaders, whereas the former conversation we just is more towards the middle and lower management, the people that actually do the work. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. so. And talk to us about that, um, I guess, that bottom, bottom up versus top down approach, because, you know, there are some organizations, mm -hmm. like you're mentioning, if there's a, a senior exec that has already bought into BPM, then it's, mm -hmm. they're going to be driving it from that top down approach, it's going to be much easier for that take up. Um, but for someone that 
might be down the the lower sort of ranks yeah. within organ within an organization but has this desire to see bpm um help yeah. improve their organization yeah. that they've got to really pitch it upwards i guess have you seen both of those work and and talk to us about what i guess what um if you are pitching it from that bottom up approach what do you need to consider to ensure that you're successful yeah so Yes, uh, just very quickly on the top down is it's basically showing them practical examples of where it's worked before. And then they get it like that. And it's not a very point on it's not a difficult conversation. Oftentimes, the bottom up one is the more difficult conversation, uh, not least of which because many of the people involved fear whether rightly or wrongly, uh, whether rationally or irrationally that you're there to engineer it so that their job is lost. Um, you know, so that they won't have a job anymore. Right. And right. so that's, it, and it's, you know, it's best to just confront that. My belief has always been, my experience has always been, it's best to just confront that head on and say, no, we are not here to engineer you out of a job. What we are here for is to make your job a lot better and easier so that you can spend your time on true value added activities rather than entering something here, entering something there, you know, all this, you know, completely wasted time and effort. So once mm. you get that, that that's a big one to overcome. And then the, the second part of that would be then to show them that it's going, again, I'll go back to the customer, show them that it's, you're going to be able to give your customer an answer while you're on the phone with them rather than saying, I'm going to have to call you back, or I don't know your answer right now. And, and again, the customer experience thing being better oftentimes uh, is another way that makes them feel better about the process. Yes. Yep. Mm. And um, you, you've also mentioned that, like, obviously, when you're going through that discovery phase of a process, mm. like you've got, mm. you've got the, the tick of approval to, to go in there and to, mm. um, to start mm. to see how BPM can transform that business. Um, you're organizing these discovery workshops or sessions where you're bringing mm. key stakeholders together to mm. understand what is the process, what is actually happening. Um, talk mm. us through, I guess, what are the key ingredients for a workshop like that? Because I, I'd imagine that with a number of different people involved, um, sometimes it can be... Um, it can be a challenge to um, to mm -hmm. I guess hit the objective, get reach the goal that you've gone in there mm -hmm. to reach. Sometimes that there might different stakeholders might disagree on what the actual process mm -hmm. is or or how it mm -hmm. should be done. If it's never been documented or understood or managed, then um, yeah, talk us through what 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 that's like. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, I'll just give you kind of the generic one because a lot of them can be extraordinarily, um, you know, unique and specific in terms of mm. the dynamic of what happens in a particular workshop. Um, but yeah, in general, I would say you would need a couple of people who are really good uh, modelers who can kind of model on the fly. You need an expert, expert facilitator. And but specifically to the point that you just made of when people start devolving into arguments over, oh, no, we do it that way. We do it this way. And to be a good, not only a good listener, but a good facilitator enough to say, well, wait, wait, now you're just tinkering around the edges. You're talking about the, you know, the 0.005% exceptions. And you're wasting a lot of time talking about that. You know, what happens 80% of the time, 90% of the time, let's just focus on that. So you need a good facilitator, you need some good modelers. And then, as I mentioned, probably a few minutes ago, it always is helpful. It's not absolutely critical, but it's very helpful to have somebody on your team who's there, who understands that part of the business, so that they can kind of play um, translator, for lack of a better word. So they can translate between business process language to the facilitator, to the modelers and the business people who are sitting there. Now, are you going to get that every time? Does, you know, that that's a, it's great if you can have somebody like that. Not everyone will have the advantage of having someone on their team who is completely familiar with, you know, the part of the business that you're trying to help. Right. But 
Yeah. Um, so that doesn't always happen. But if you can't have that, then at least have somebody who understands at least the rudiments of what they do. You know, they might not have to, you know, intimate knowledge, but certainly, you know, if they understand something of what they do, that's always very helpful. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Mm-hmm. And, and I've, I've seen, you know, different organizations, uh, particularly here in Australia that, you know, that there'll be a, a, a huge wave of um, BPM, if you could call it that, where, where the, the right um, senior executives in, in place or the right teams being brought in, maybe a, a, the chief process officers being that role has mm-hmm. been created and, and there's a yeah. huge push or emphasis towards BPM, but um, over say, three, four, five years, however long, in some cases, um, it, it seems to lose its momentum and it, mm-hmm. then it, it all gets shafted out again. And, and I, I've even seen this, um, I, I've even seen that this year, um, uh, some organisations dur- through uh, during COVID have realised, look, oh, we, we need to um, understand our processes. We need to um, understand what, what's actually happening in our business now that everyone's working remotely. But there, but mm-hmm. I've noticed there are some organisations that this year has also been the time where um, that whole team is, you know, being being shafted and mm-hmm. and for whatever reasons, I'm not too sure. But I guess mm-hmm. talk to us about longevity in BPM once. <clears throat> Once that the chief process mm-hmm. officer has moved on, once once that that um, I guess that process um, champion has has left that the organisation, how do you ensure that all of that, everything that's been set up, everything that's been put in place um, to help that organisation manage and improve continuously improve their processes, lasts and and can, keeps going? Mm-hmm. Yeah, it, it's an excellent question. Um, and I think, you know, I'll use a, an economics term um, to answer the question, is the, the law of diminishing return. So if you, and I'll try to do it from your watcher's perspective, where it goes like that. So you start off with a very steep curve of you get benefit, 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 benefit. And then after a while, the curve starts, you know, flattening because there's only so much uh, efficiencies that, that you can draw out of things. And, and where BPM, where you risk running uh, the problem that you just uh, outlined is when that curve starts flattening. And so I, I, guess, I'm, I, I guess I'll answer, uh, answer it in a kind of counterintuitive way is, you know, maybe that's not such a bad thing. Uh, because for that curve to have gotten flat in the first place means that you've probably gotten as much efficiency out of that particular process as you can, if you can. And if that happened, then great. <laughs> but most likely what's going to happen is that noise will start coming in from other places. Um, and this is where I, I, th- I think it happens a lot is that so I always want to look at, the, you know, a lot of times I think people will conflate good process management with digitization and good technology. And particularly in, you know, 2020, when we have a lot of things, you know, we have the, you know, you can just look at your phone and you can order a pizza and it gets delivered in 15 minutes and, you know, all that. That's great and wonderful. But everybody thinks that, you know, so many processes are just so intertwined with technology that they're actually one and the same. And so what I will go back to in terms of why those things start, why processes will start disintegrating after, not disintegrating, that's a bad word, but becoming less efficient over time if people don't keep refreshing them is because my view has always been that the single biggest means of achieving efficiency at a large, particularly a large corporation, particularly a large older corporation, is that I will do, you know, dollars to donuts, that the biggest source of process inefficiency isn't the technology and it's not the people, it's the policies of the company. Because policies over time, and particularly again in large corporations. Over time, they grow from a good policy document should be no more than two pages. But over time, policy documents end up becoming procedure documents, end up taking on a life of their own, and you can look at them and they become 
60 pages long. Yep. And then the technology people get involved. What do they do? They take the policy and they try to code the policy into the system. And that's why you end up with systems that are trying to account for every exception under the sun, you know, because that's how the policy got the iterations of the policy started and the, the person started to uh, explode exponentially and all these things. So to me, the biggest thing that you can do to keep a process efficient over time and to make people's lives a lot better and with a lot fewer headaches is constantly review your policies. And it sounds boring and it is, it is deadly dull. Um, <laughs> but it is, is the number one thing that most companies get tripped up on. And it's the number one thing that no one ever looks at. Right. Um, after that, then, you know, then look at your policy, look at your procedures, make sure your procedures are right. Yeah. Uh, if I had to kind of categorize, you know, causes of inefficiency and causes of bad business process management, I would say 40% of it is policy related. 35% of it is probably um, people related. People just don't understand what they're supposed to do. And that's usually new people. Probably about 20% um, would be an actual bad process itself that you know was inherently bad from the very, very beginning and set up poorly. And there's probably only 10%, which is really technology. Wow. Everybody blames technology, but it's the most of the time it's been my experience that the technology does exactly what you told it to do. You're just <laughs> not using it the way it was intended to do, or people forget, you know, the people that designed it, you know, are gone decades ago. Nobody know, really understands how it got designed in the first place. Right. And it can do all kinds of things, but nobody remembers how to do it, or they just aren't using it the way it was designed. So much like the, much like process, there's very few, systems I've seen inherently bad mm -hmm. got they got changed and made bad because the people that coded them that way were coding something that was inefficient so they just they immortalized the inefficiency to begin with if that, if that makes sense right right mm -hmm. yeah no that's good and um like looking looking to the future now um mm -hmm. Obviously, over the last, say, 10, 15, 20 years, um, technology, if we, if we could, could speak on that, um, it's obviously made a, a huge advancements um, in terms of what's possible, um, starting with, you know, your basic um, process, your basic process flow charts, things like that. Um, now we're talking about things like robotic process automation, um, process mining. Uh, we've got different um, topics or to technologies like this that um, are, are quite, um, are talked about quite a lot at the moment. Um, and so so one question I'd, I have is what does the future of BPM look like? And, and not just from a technology point of view, but um, in your eyes and your perspective, where are we heading mm -hmm. over the next five to 10 years in terms of BPM? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so certainly, uh, you know, certainly process mining, you know, massive fan of that. I, I think it shows you uh, the, the reason I like it so much is because it shows you what's actually happening, what not what you think is happening. Um, and that's amazingly powerful because most often than, <laughs> unfortunately, more often than not, you know, what you think is happening is not happening at all. And, you know, and, and you can find out why. And it's because, oh, you know, Sally created this workaround and you can actually see the workaround happening uh, you know, <laughs> rather than uh, Sally having reported the isn't working anymore. Um, sorry, not to pick on Sally, but <laughs> um, no. So yeah, no. I think process mining is is a, an immense tool. is an incredibly uh, powerful tool, and its ability to then do you know the next step of that automated root cause analysis, so that then can say oh, you know the then we can design something that you know where we have all the the we have the you know accurate data, you know, which we know exactly what happened, we know why it happened, and we know how to fix it. So that I think is is a you know a, a big big win uh, for BPM uh, in terms of things like RPA. Um, 
RPA has its has its you know detractors and its supporters, and I'll I'll be honest with you, halfway in the I'm probably right on the fence about that. Um, you know, again, I think it's one of these things that the process really has to be understood and simplified before you try to automate it with an RPA solution. And if you don't, and again, I started the conversation talking about how I you know, was going to age, you know, age myself by talking about, you know, 1985. And I remember <laughs> back in those days, still when Lotus 123 existed before everybody was using Excel. And I still remember the horror stories of, you know, uh, you, you wrote this wonderful macro and then somebody went in and they added a column and it threw the whole thing off because nobody bothered you know, that they added a column or added a row or something like that. And so that's, that's always the image. I know that's I'm over grossly oversimplifying how RPA works, but it's the same kind of thing there. So yes. for me, RPA has always been kind of a stopgap. You know, it's it's the bridge between you know a a process that was completely manual in the first place, and it's just making a manual process go a lot faster. It's the bridge between that and true digitization. I always had the problem saying digitization, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, but no, I, th I think we're BPM, you know, uh, again, back to the, the process mining and the cultural, if when you have the people with the culture of continuous improvement and, and process centric, again, from the customer's perspective, and you have data that not only that, not only that people are reacting to, are acting proactively with so that the data leads you to the solution to the root cause which then leads you to continuous improvement and i don't you know i don't mean from a ci you know simple thing but you know large scale improvements till you almost get to that point again on the edge of the you know the um uh, again sorry lost my train of thought the uh not the point of no return but the Law of diminishing return. Sorry, right, right. Uh, where where you're making your uh, your process as efficient as you can, that's great. You know, let's all try to get to that point. And then we can all just sit back and relax and, and let technology, you know, do the work for us. But, <laughs> but <laughs> yeah, no, I'm just being a little facetious there. But <laughs> you no, know, I, I I think where I'll go answer your question in a slightly different way. I think where BPM as a uh, profession and as a uh, discipline within a lot of corporations kind of went down a little bit. It, you know, it was the flavor of the month for a while. And then you know, everyone, because they didn't, you know, going back to the very one of some of the very first parts of the conversation that we had, because there wasn't enough buy-in for the time commitment. Right. And so enough of the benefits weren't realized. But I think now in, in, in a weird way, I think, you know, 2020 and everything that we've had to do with COVID might be showing senior executives again that, yeah, this is a very valuable, not only discipline to have, but a cultural element that your company should have so that we are, are always trying to move towards, you know, maximum efficiency for our customers' benefit. So you know, I, I can see with all the uh, advances in technology and the option, if you will, of, of BPM um, ideals, ideals, mm -hmm. then I, I see those things converging. I do see quite a, a good um, outlook for the whole discipline. I, I think the, the only, if I would give one criticism, it, it's that I think it's been too rooted in academia, right? And it needs to there there needs to be way more of a of a here are the practical benefits. Here is how it has you know worked in the in the quote unquote real world, and these are the benefits that people receive. And then then it becomes a domino effect. You yes. Know, then it becomes the jump on the bandwagon. Oh. You know, oh, wait a minute, that, that department or that company had a huge benefit from this. I want some of that, too. You know, mm -hmm. so, and, and unfortunately, because of, you know, the global financial crisis or this or that or the other thing, 
I, it, it was, it's like people almost got there and then for a myriad of different reasons, it, you know, something else became uh, the focus of the CEO or whomever. And, but I, I think I can see where we're just getting over that final hurdle now. And I think it's quite a, a, a fun and interesting uh, an extraordinarily valuable profession to be in, uh, certainly in the, the years to come. Yeah, yeah, definitely. That's good. And and for someone listening right now that um, they, they're listening to our conversation and maybe this is the start of their BPM journey, maybe they, they're, they're listening to this, they, they understand their organization's need for BPM, um, mm -hmm. but they're really going to be the one driving it. Um, despite what level they may be, um, where would you point them to, I guess, continue their learning, conti to continue that education? Um, is there, are there particular, I guess, industry influences or thought leaders or are there particular books out there or, um, or e even particular courses that you would recommend? But if, yeah, if someone wanted to, I guess, continue learning more about BPM, um, mm. or is it finding that mentor? Is it finding someone that is further down the journey than them? Um, connect with them on LinkedIn, and then yeah, yeah how would you? What would you? Okay. Um, so in, in multiple ways, um, I would answer that, Daniel. Um, first and foremost, you just mentioned it. You know, a, a mentor is always a, a good, you know, whatever your career path is, you know, whether it's BPM, whether it's nursing, whether it's, you know, teaching, you know, having a mentor is always a great thing. So that I, I would always recommend that. Um, in terms of from an academic standpoint, uh, certainly, I mean, obviously I, I do, you know, the guest lecturing for QUT, so I'll give them a shout out. Uh, so Queensland University um, of Technology always has, is a very good place to learn and they do, uh, my understanding is they do uh, distance learning on, on uh, online learning. Um, folks like, uh, you know, some of the people that you've had on your podcast uh, already, uh, uh, Marcello, uh, Roger Tavere, uh, Michael Roseman, Certainly all the papers that any of these gentlemen uh, have written are always a very good places to go. Um, university of Utrecht um, in Holland is another university which is, is known for this. Uh, so there's a lot of places you can go academically. Uh, in terms of companies, um, certainly, you know, again, I was very fortunate to work for G Capital uh, and General Electric in, in general, uh, no pun intended, was you know, renowned for having a very process-centric um, uh, ethos. So I would, if you're looking for jobs and you want to do it in BPM, you know, see, it, you don't have to have a BPM role itself to get started at a company that is known for having uh, an adoption of some type of, of BPM uh, methodology or uh, part of their culture. In terms of if you already are in role, um, even if it's not a BPM role, but it's something that where you want to get at, uh, and I have given this advice to other folks that I mentor, is that who want to know how can I start, how can I convince my senior managers that this is a good is to and depending it depends on the size of your company but find one thing that you know something quite well um, that you know um, how it works and how it should work and then do the analysis you know say this is how it works today do the you know do the current state do the future state do the roadmap um, of how we from the current state to what you envisage as the future state you know be conservative with how much time and cost you think it would be and then present it even if it's even if you're not in a BPM role you know that doesn't preclude you or stop you from doing you know that kind of work and and I've seen people do this in my career before and they got you know all kinds of accolades for oh wow this person isn't even part of that department but they thought out they saw a problem they thought outside of the box they presented a solution Those people you know, if, if you say, oh, there's a problem over here, they'll tune you out. But if you say, oh, there's a problem here, and here's the solution, they'll listen to you. 
Now, it might not be the most elegant solution, might not even be the right solution, but at least you're offering something. So that's how that, and that's for the people who aren't even in BPM but want to get into it. That, that's kind of the getting the camel's nose under the tent um, method of getting into BPM. And then, you, then somebody will say, yeah, so not dissimilar to, I, I started in the very beginning of this conversation, how I kind of got into this was I was a financial accountant, but then I became kind of the, the answer guy for all things about how much does it actually cost to perform this process. So I kind of fell into this, you know, from that method. And so there, there's lots of ways of getting into BPM and then to get your company interested in BPM that aren't necessarily, you know, the, the tried and true methods. That's so. great. And I, and I hear that quite a lot, actually, that people do find themselves in BPM just because I think it is a, definitely a mindset thing. It's a way of thinking about things. It's a way of um, un, try, wanting to understand the process so that you can look for areas of opportunity and improvement. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah. I, I, through a number of the interviews I, we've already had, yeah, I, I do hear that, that they were, they were in the organization for some other particular role, um, but just they naturally thought about process and they naturally thought about how can we improve things. But um, John, we, we can only you know fit so much into a 50 minute interview. We've been able to stretch it a little bit longer today, but um, obviously we're, we're only scraping the surface yeah. in regards to um, understanding and learning about BPM. But I, I just want to thank you for your time today. I think yeah. that the audience is, is going to glean a lot from your experience and, and the stories that you've been sharing that I know it's, it's really going to um, help people a, a lot, um, whether that is to um, help them on their own learning and understanding mm -hmm. or, or whether they can actually use this interview and, and send it mm -hmm. through to um, their colleagues or their senior management uh, to help them articulate business process management and what it can do for their organization. So I just want to thank you for um, joining, sitting down with me today and then sharing your knowledge there. Okay. No, it's, it's been my distinct pleasure. Thank you very much, Daniel.